Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremy, joined by my co-host, Shane. Shane. And we are Triple Threat on WXJM.org and WXJM 88.7 FM. Today, we are not joined by Hayden, unfortunately, but that is all right, because we still have an excellent show for you. How are you doing today, Shane? Doing all right. It's been a good start to the week. Almost a Thanksgiving break. Can't wait. Really could use it. I'm sure a lot of other students could use it, too. It is Thanksgiving break next week. Uh, everyone's going home. It's going to be great. Get to uh, not deal with any schoolwork for a while. You know how it is, right? But unfortunately, they don't get the WXJM radio show next week. Either. I wouldn't say that. It would still be live on our YouTube channel. Yeah, it's going to be after. there. We're going to gonna do a little bit of a fancy show, you know, a little bit of an at-home kind of thing. Gonna post it onto the good old YouTubes, uh, and that'll, that'll, you can find that one at a, a Triple Threat show on YouTube. You just search it up, find the one with the little uh, hand-drawn icon <laughs> by yours truly, of course. You know, you I'm very proud of it. Graphic designer over here. Absolutely. You know, I'm just saying I'm a bit of an artist. Just a bit of an artist. Just a bit. Just a bit. And a writer too, right? A writer? Nah, not really. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't consider myself a writer. But a broadcaster, Broadcaster, right? that's the and one. what do we broadcast about? We broadcast about sports. Specifically. JMU sports. JMU sports. Excellent job, my friend. We're moving on to the JMU sports report. And, you know, we're going to kick it off with basketball this time. Oh, dude. We're going to kick it off with a men's basketball <sighs> team. Dude, you had the perfect transition for football. Why would I? Oh, no, nah, it's fine. We'll All get right. to that later. I, I'm excited. About I was that like, one. oh, what a good setup for football. No, we're gonna do Kick that. it off to even. All right, you know, let's go basketball. We're going to do that later. Right. I, I like. I want to save the football for last because there's some exciting stuff there. All right. Um, men's basketball. They did start their season off this week, so that's awesome. Uh, they started off strong, winning their first two games of the season. First game, I'd say... Uh, I'd say they won pretty convincingly. Shane, do you, you want to guess how many points they won by? It was like close to 100. Yeah, it was pretty close to 100. Final score was uh, 135 to 40. So um, if we do a little bit of uh, some big old mental maths in our head, we, we come up with 95 points. I just picture the Simpsons meme where it's like, stop it, he's already dead. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's just, you didn't have to do it to him, but... I mean, but you kind of had to. You you kinda, start it, you're in college basketball. You you kind of have to. Right, you got to start off with a little bit of that statement win. Yeah. You know, you can't get any better than that. And then they went and played uh, Old Dominion on Saturday. And they uh, they did win that game, so they're perfect on the season, you know. By a lot closer. It, wasn't, it wasn't quite 95 <laughs> points. But you know what they say, a win's a win by, they don't uh, ask by, how. by 5 or 95, you know. Worth the same. They did win by five points, 58 to 53 versus Old Dominion. Uh, and as I mentioned, they did. Ha they do currently have a perfect season. Undefeated, baby. Undefeated. So they look to keep their undefeated se season going with three games this week. Uh, Tuesday at Eastern Kentucky, Friday at home versus George Mason, and Monday at Kent State in the first round of the Naples Invitational. So that's like a tournament kind of thing. They, they haven't announced it, but the first game is on Monday. So that's going to be fun for them. Good luck to them. Yeah, we'll move on. Since we're doing basketball, you know, keep it nice and together, right? Yep. Women's basketball team also started their season this week. They went 1-1. One and one. That's still very good. They opened their season with a 84-69 to 69 win at home versus Virginia on Tuesday. And then they went and they played... The fourth ranked team in the country. They went and played Maryland. And they lost 45 to 81. But that's all right. You're not going to. It's not every day that you that you play a, uh, a top five team in the country, you know? Yeah. Not an easy game, not an easy contest. And it could have been worse. Could have been a 95 points. Could have been so much worse. <laughs> yeah. Right. They held them to 81 points. You know, that's pretty good. That's good defense. And. I don't know. You know, There's still a lot of season left. A lot of season left. A lot of stuff to work on. Uh, they have two games coming up this week: Thursday at Liberty and Sunday at home versus Hampton. So the you know, schedule only gets easier from here. <laughs> wow, you're really, really gonna do them like that. All right. 
I mean, number four ranked Maryland. Now you're right. It's it's ranked. You're right. Moving on to men's soccer, they might not have been able to compete in the CAA championships, but they still uh, had six players named to the all-conference team, with uh, Tyler Clegg, Luca Earnhardt, and Melker Onshelm uh, named to the all-conference first team, and Axel Allander and Rodrigo N Robles named to the all-conference second team, and of course there's a sixth one being uh, Alex Kerouac named to the third all-conference team. So, lots of success. This is actually the second year in a row where the uh, JMU men's soccer team has had six people named to the all-conference teams. It's so frustrating. It's a little frustrating. You know, I to, also know To the league that shall not be named. Yeah, I, I noticed. I, I, I think it's really fun. All over the JMU athletics website this week, they and all over JMU media, literally every single every single JMU sports media thing, they refuse to put CAA in any of their releases. Instead, it's conference. For instance, there was the the you know we usually talk about the CAA players of the week, right? Yeah. This time they were listed as conference player of the weeks, which I thought, I thought that was awesome. I really love that. The amount of pettiness in all of this. Absolutely. Phenomenal. No, it's 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 awesome. I love seeing it. It's the least we can do. <laughs> um, let's see. What what we got? We got got cross country. You want to do cross country? We'll do cross country. Women's cross country team. They they finished off their season at the NCAA Regional Championships, where they finished in 19th place out of 31 teams. So pretty middling. But since it is cross country, you know. There's only one person that could possibly be leading for the Dukes. And who would that be, Jeremy? Of course, that would be Miranda Stanhope. First Duke to finish. She came in 28th place overall. Insane what she's doing this season. She finished at a time of 20 minutes, 58 seconds, and 9 milliseconds. I'm not sure if that's mil... Is it, is it milliseconds? I think it's It's got to be. What else would it be? I don't know. I feel like there's some other measurement that I'm missing. What? Metric time? Sure. <laughs> It's a meter race. It's six thousand meter race. You know, they measure that and um, uh, not. They just got a different it. interval for seconds over right. there. Right. Why not? You can never know. I don't know. I don't know these things. I'm not going to pretend to know these things. Anyway, so wh how many race series were in that? So many. So many. So many. A lot of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> like at least two. <laughs> and she got twenty. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good for her. It's good to hear that she's continuing <laughs> on her great pace and great season. Nah, no, there were there were thirty one there were thirty one teams. So like each yeah. team has like I, I want to say like ten to fifteen people on it. So that's or, or fifteen to twenty people on it. You know, that's a lot. Wow, that's and a she's lot. She still finished top twenty. Right, that's awesome. Awesome, yeah. Yeah. And uh, in a week, where uh, we're doing our best to get back at the CAA. Women's Swimming Diving Team did an awesome job. They, they swept the CAA pod meet, you know. And on top of that, they had three people named all com named com that got conference honors. <laughs> you know. Jessica Prine, she was named uh, the conference co-swimmer of the week. Lexi Lehman was named the conference diver of the week. And Alexa Holloway was named the conference rookie diver of the month. Of the month. Wow. Not just the week, the month of October. You know, it's pretty good to hear. Not a big deal? No, not really. Not really that big of a deal. You know, they've got the volleyball team, which, you know, they had a really good season. They did finish their season this weekend. Uh, they split their two games against Hofstra. First one, they won in three sets. And then the second one, they fell in three sets. Didn't they lose a game last week, too? Mm-hmm. And what, that was their second game, mm -hmm. right? So that record of yeah. they are undefeated after they haven't lost back to back games at all this season. They Never. are undefeated after a loss. Yeah. Their final record was seventeen and seven. Uh, and their final final in conference record was uh eleven and five. Which would have put them um, tied for second in the conference. You what know, just shame. just something to think about. Yeah. Something to something to uh something to leave you with as we as we think about this. To add on to the women's volleyball team, Miet Miette Veldman, first player to surpass 300 kills in a season in, since 2018. All right. And 
senior Savannah Marshall finishes her JMU volleyball career with 993 digs. Oh, so close. So, cl- so, so close. So close to the millennial mark, but still an impressive college career so yeah. far. No, that's, that's, oh, dang. That's, that's a little bit frustrating. I mean, yeah. that's, that's still awesome getting that close to a thousand. We're still proud of her. Absolutely. I, I tried to like call it last time, but I'm, Fortunately, she didn't get there, but still a really impressive career. Yeah. And then we hinted at it earlier, men's football. I'm going to talk about this before we get into some of the other things that uh, happened at JMU. Uh, men's football, they, uh, the second-ranked uh, James Madison Dukes continued their dominance this week with a 32-22 to win at 25th-ranked William & Mary. With that win, they improved to 9-1 on the season, 6-1 in conference, and currently we're on a five-game winning streak. Now, Shane, you kind of kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but our kicker, Ethan Radke, he is having an incredible season and has continued his incredible career. He, he broke not only FCS records, which we talked about, he broke NCAA records. Really? Two of them. Which ones? I'll get into that real quick. So he broke two NCAA records. First one, most career field goals. How many do you think he has? 100. You nailed it. It's almost like you knew that. It's <laughs> almost as if I did some research before him. That's crazy. He has 100 field goals. That's most in NCAA history. And he also broke the ru- record for uh, most career points by a kicker at 517 points. In all of NCAA. All of NCAA. No other kicker has kicked more. Nope. Think of all the great kickers in the league. Has not done what this man has done. Wow. In addition to that, he also broke his own single season record for most field goals made in a year. 28. And he's uh, he's two away from making uh, the most field goals all time in one season in the FCS. So pretty good and there's something else he did I mean a few other things he also broke the school record again (laughs) again I have to stress this again his own record yeah that he set earlier this season but before he set it earlier in the season he tied it you know so he went from four to five to six field goals in a single game that is so many field goals it's a new career high for him in points 20 points in a single game that's a lot of points Six field goals. Six field goals. <laughs> um, and he also he also won the uh, he also won the National Player of the Week award for the second time this season. So that's like all of the FCS. Man, that game. I remember during Parents Weekend, and I heard he he like missed a very makeable kick. Yeah, those were his only two missed kicks of the year. He must have been. Really upset about those kicks. Oh, he was pissed. Because after that game, he's been making everything. He's breaking all these records. He's like, he must have just put in the work and just stayed so focused to, like, bounce back from it. Absolutely. No doubt. And then, you know, just lesser note, he also won uh, Special Teams Player of the Week. So, like... (laughs) It's kind of a given at that point. Yeah, I mean, you do all this other stuff, you gotta, you gotta, right? It's the least you can do. Right. So, senior night for the football team is next week. That's the final game of the regular season. It's going to be against Towson at 2. We're going to, this will be the last game for people like the kicker, Ethan Radke, and quarterback Cole Johnson, and probably a lot of other people that I just did not write down. Um, In another note, for Ethan Radke. He's also the 18th all-time leading scorer in all of college football. What does that mean? He has the 18th most points for a career in college football. Oh, yeah. All right. That makes sense. I don't think... I mean, did, did you see the... I don't, I don't know if he can climb 17 spots in the playoffs, but... I didn't see how close he was. I was just surprised he's... With all his other accolades, I didn't <laughs> check to see how many other records he could break or what he's in reach of. Right. You know, fun stuff. Um, Any other sports news? Yeah, I've got some things. Before I get to them, 
I'd like to congratulate the, uh, the four Dukes that won weekly awards. Ethan Ratke, Jessica Prime, Lexi Lemon, and uh, Alexa Holloway. And to the soccer players, congratulations for uh, making the all-conference all teams. teams. Two things real quick. Do you want to get into the 2022-2023 letter of intent, people, or do you want to do a uh, CAA update? Let's do a CAA update. All right. So, developing story, CAA update. The CAA confirmed their decision to ban JMU after a discussion and a vote. The board then put out a statement. They put out four points. I'm not going to read all of them. Um, I'm going to summarize the one that stood out to me the most. So this was the second point. They said, JMU alone set the timeline for its withdrawal from the CAA, having full knowledge of its consequences, of the consequences of its decision. The university could have chosen to announce its withdrawal from the CAA at the end of the fall 2021 semester, allowing its men's soccer and volleyball teams to compete in their respective CAA championships. Additionally, if JMU had chosen to defer its withdrawal announcement to an even later date, most, if not all, of its qualifying teams would have been permitted to participate in the CAA championships. JMU chose a timeline that, that fit its needs. So basically, summarize that one. They're coming out here, and they're saying, you know what, JMU, it's your fault. You could have waited. So because you didn't wait, we're going to punish all your student athletes now. It, it doesn't... It doesn't make sense. It's petty. It's some bull. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pawning off the blame, which, I mean, to be fair, they, they were warned. Before, but it shouldn't have to. It shouldn't have to come yeah, to this. But it shouldn't have to come to this. Like as you said, all the other teams that went to the Sun Belt, no other division did this except the CAA. Right. So there's, they they have a little bit of a point, but it's not. It it doesn't mean they, doesn't mean this was the right thing. Just to because do. they have a point, that doesn't mean it's a very good point. Right. It just doesn't justify to, what they did to our student athletes. Right. You just you can't. You got you got to tell both sides of the story a little bit, no matter how uh, not cool it is, you know. Anyway, let's move on to some more positive news. Letters of intent. Letters of intent basically say, "Hey, these people will sign uh, scholarships and play for JMU next year." There were a bunch of a bunch of players from a diff bunch of different sports that signed, including eight people for lacrosse. So I'm just going to run through the names real quick. Uh, the men's basketball team, uh, Jarrell Robertson. The men's golf team, Owen Coase, Garrett Kula, and Sunel Pruvaba. <laughs> Excuse me. The women's field hockey, uh, Lila Harlock, Ala, A Alice Roper, uh, Madeline Tierney, and Skylar Brown. The women's golf team had Maria Atwood. The women's lacrosse team had eight people, Caitlin Bowden, Maddie Epke, Brianna Manella, Josie Pell, Jordan Peterson, Courtney Quirk, Olivia Rongo, and Lauren Savage. Uh, the women's softball team signed four, Kayla Berry, Bella Hensler, KK Mathis, Cameron Nash, and the women's women dive team signed a few people as well. Uh, Jamie Cornwell, Ann Chapel Ellington, Riley Nougat, Maggie O'Mara and Alex Volk, and finally the women's volleyball team had one person signed, Ari Reed. So, congrats to all the new Dukes. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you guys play next next year. So have they? They've accepted the offer, right? Um. So letter I letter of intent is basically saying so. The way the NCAA works, it's like you have to do it at a certain time, uh, and there's like rules and stuff. You can't officially sign until like. X date or whatever. This is just saying, hey, I promise I'm going to sign with you guys. Okay. Kind of thing. So it's not official, but it's yeah. all but official. Gotcha. Uh, I've sense. heard in some for football, some people are like, yeah, and then they switch to another team or something like that. I don't know. It's probably very rare. I've right. just heard some dramatic scenarios like that. Not Nothing's official. They're just saying, hey, it's like a promise. You know, I promise I'll do this. Yeah. But it's not, like, written in stone, written in blood or whatever. Gotcha. You know. Does so that cover all the JMU sports that news? That is what I got for the JMU sports report. 
Um, it's at this point that I would like to remind everyone that you are listening to uh, WXJM uh, and WXJM.org and WXJM 88.7 FM. Uh, this is Triple Threat uh, with me, Jeremy, and Shane. Uh, and without further ado, Shane, would you like to take us into a little bit of hockey? All right, so to start off hockey news, we have some GM issue, general manager issues. Former GM of the Anaheim Ducks is under, was under investigation for workplace misconduct and was placed on temporary leave. Later, he resigns bec- uh, to undergo an alcohol abuse program. So for what I've looked into, he has created a toxic work environment for the Anaheim Ducks. His replacement is Jeff Solomon. Reports say he is being accused of verbal abuse and just creating a work environment based off of fear. He being the new guy or the old guy? The old guy, his name is Bob Murray. All right. So... It's good that we're finally seeing change in the NHL. It looks like the catalyst of the Kyle Beach situation, maybe people are more willing to come forward to end some of these toxic traits. So it's a good thing to hear. It was also reported on the NHL hotline, which has been newly instated and updated. So it seems like, okay, maybe these things are working. So hopefully Bob Murray gets the help he needs and hopefully we can see other people come out and get these toxic bad influences out of the NHL. Hopefully. You know, we had, obviously, you know, you mentioned the Kyle Beach story, but uh, less seriously, the the Robin Leonard stuff that we touched on right before the season started. That kind of went private, even though Robin Leonard kind of you know, he was like, I'm never letting this go private. I'm gonna gonna fight publicly so everyone can see this. And then he made a deal and uh, it kinda fizzled out, you know? Who knows, maybe he'll do some more stuff in the off season when he has more time because being a starting goaltender, one of the best goaltenders in the NHL, it's gonna take up a lot of your time. Who knows what legal issues he may run into. Right, you know. So this, I understand that he's going to an alcohol abuse program. Like, uh, if that's the issues he's going through and that's part of it, um, all the power to him. But it still doesn't excuse the fact. We don't know how he treated some of his coworkers or the people under him, but report, reports saying he's a jerk and he's not pleasing to work for, then... It probably should have. He shouldn't have gotten the job for that long in the first place. Yeah, probably not. So, thankfully, it looks like this is getting resolved, and hopefully we can see other issue um, instances like this in the future where we can create a better environment for hockey. Hopefully. Uh, and we brought up... Uh, were you saying something? No, nah, go for it. And we brought up Kyle Beach earlier. Again, I don't want his story to phase out, so I did some research to see how his case is being handled, and the Blackhawks still haven't settled on a a settlement yet. They have a disagreement on how much. It seems like the sticking factor is the lawyer wants compensation for the NHL career he could have had, as I mentioned in the other episode, that he was an 11th overall pick. Like, that is not a nobody. That's not some late round fluke who somehow, like, worked his butt off to get to the end. Like, he, he had potential. Like, he had potential since he was a teenager. It was very easy to see him have a NHL career. And then the Brad Aldrich se- sexual assault happens, and it completely that's something like that will just throw you off mentally for the rest of your career and be having a strong mentality is a big part of being an athlete so i can see the argument to where his nhl career could have been taken away from him and so there's a whole bunch of issues with that number going on they're trying to avoid court but 
I'm very optimistic about Kyle Beach's case because they have all the leverage. It just seems like they have a lot of evidence to dictate that they could, and he should get the most from what he wants. Right. Because this shouldn't have taken him 10 years. Absolutely. Now this gone on way too long or had nothing happened for way too long. Yeah. And then John Doe, number two, he number two. was, he was the 16 year old high schooler ah. who was sexually assaulted by Brad Aldrich. And this was the case that sent Aldrich to prison. The NHL, the NHL said they would not pay for his therapy. They're trying to, they were, they deferred it to the Blackhawks organization. And the mother of that boy is very frustrated with the process. She does not trust the Blackhawks organization. I wouldn't. They were asking for medical records, financial statements, school transcripts, well, a lot of unseemingly unnecessary things. Um, from what I've heard from the Staff and Graph podcast is that he can't get the therapy he needs because his family can't afford it or they don't have the right insurance or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a very sticky situation and they really should do something about it and hopefully we can see updates that, that these people can get the help they need. Yep. And other news, the Pittsburgh Penguins have a settled their sexual assault allegations with the Wilkes-Barre Penguins, the AHL affiliate, with a court mediary se settlement. So the people involved in that case, it looks like it's solved for now. Hopefully there isn't any other instances, but if there were, hopefully they get brought to light and this gets handled. All right, that's it for depressing hockey news. Let's get to some more uplifting stuff. We love the le we love the stuff that's not depressing. Yeah. Your uh, Anaheim Ducks, they are doing really well. And part of the reason why they're doing well is because Troy Terry is still on the point streak. How many games? It's last week he was at 10 games. This week he's at 14 games. He currently has 11 goals, 9 assists for 20 points on the year. That's awesome. Love to hear it. Love to see it. And I would like to talk about the Anaheim Ducks. Oh, because please do. I didn't think they would get off to this good of a start. Quack, quack. Jeremy and Hayden were very fond of the Ducks. They were like, hey, watch out for this team. I think they can be good. And I, think, and I said, no, I think you guys are crazy. And it looks like they are right in proving me dead wrong so far. Hey, let's go. I love being right. It's they're like a, my favorite thing. They're a young team. They're full of talent. They got some stars. John Gibson is a phenomenal goaltender. They are currently at a 9-4-3 record. That's good enough for second place in the Pacific. They Pretty are good. seventh in overall league standings. They are currently on a seven-game win streak. Ooh. They're fourth in the league for goals four per game. They have the fourth best power play, the sixth best penalty kill, and John Gibson has, a, has eight wins, a 2.37 goals against average, and a 924 save percentage. It's going to say um pretty good, right? That's not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. No, yeah, it just sounds pretty good. So it's very exciting if they can keep this up. They have some young exciting players to look out for. Ryan Getzloff who just had his 1000th career point. Off of his only goal of the season was the one that got him to a thousand career points. He looks like he's in his prime again. Snaps for him. It'd be hopefully they're a fun team to watch. Hopefully they can keep this up and see him make the playoffs. That'd be awesome for that team. And then on the other end, the biggest disappointment for me so far has been the New York Islanders. So I picked the New York Islanders to win the Metro Division this year. And they are l currently last place right now. Really? What? In the Metro Division. What? They're last in the Metro Division. What? I mean, the Metro Division is a stacked division. Right, but, but the it's Islanders. still you. You had to be better than I thought. You would be at least better than last place in the division at this point in the season. Right, but they made didn't they, they made it to the Eastern Eastern Finals? They, they were back to back Eastern Conference Final Twice. losers yeah. to the. Tampa Bay Lightning, the eventual Stanley Cup champs. So it showed, like, they were good enough to compete with Tampa. And last year, it was game seven, one nothing loss. Yeah. 
easily could have gone their way and they could have been facing Montreal in the final. So this team, who hasn't really had a lot of changes happen to them, is now sitting last in the Metro at 5-4-2. and two. They'll turn it around. Hopefully. Probably. Maybe. So the biggest issue for them is goal scoring. They are 6th worst in the league for goal scoring. And, the, and offensively, it's just you can't, you don't see it. It's just who are their, like, the stars, Matthew Barzell. Yeah, Barzell and... Anders the, Lee. Yeah, that guy. For, Former 40 goal scorer, like didn't Brock Nelson, didn't. Josh Bailey. They're just not putting the puck in the back of the net. Oliver Wallstrom, the young guy, they're expecting big things out of him. He hasn't really lived up to snuff yet. And they're just known globally as a great defensive team. But it doesn't matter if you have good defense if you can't put your own goals and contribute to the lead. You know what they say, Shane? Defense wins championships. Why aren't they winning championships? Because <laughs> the Tampa Bay Lightnings. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Tampa Bay Lightnings there, to be frank. So they still have time to turn it around, but it's still surprising that they just haven't looked good at this point in the season. And speaking of the Tampa Bay Lightning, they just lost 4-1 to them tonight. The Islanders lost to the Lightning 4-1? Tonight, yeah. Tonight. And that's without Nikita Kucherov. They're still a good team without Nikita Kucherov, but still. Again, and they just don't have the offensive production. And they're also a aging team. They're like one of the oldest cores in the NHL. And it doesn't help that they signed a old Zach Parisi and a 42, 43-year-old Zidino Chara. So... I don't. Maybe they need to get younger. Who knows? Hopefully they can. If the season's still early, they can still make a turnaround. Hopefully, for my prediction's sake and their sake, that they can move up in the division. In other news, speaking of the exact opposite of not underperforming, Connor McDavid has reached 600 career points. All right. The best. Offensive is player that, in the league so far. Is that the quickest to reach 600? He is the sixth fastest player to reach 600 career points. Wow. So in he's reached it in 421 games played, which is a 1.43 points per game average. Players in front of him are Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, Peter Stastny, Mike Bossy, and Yari Curry. Those are big all, names. All Hall of Famers, might I add. So, he's pretty much on pace already, and he already has the accolades to be a Hall of Famer right now if he wanted to. Yeah. Like, already, it's... This, this man has to win a Stanley Cup by the end of his career. I it mean, would be a shame if he doesn't. There are people that don't, you know? Yes, but he's... This guy is putting better offensive production than the current best players in their prime of our generation. Like, he's already putting up Crosby and Ovechkin-like numbers. And this man, he's only 24. He still has so much career left. And it's just, it's always going to be held over your head if you do not have that Stanley Cup as part of your legacy. Like, Joe Thornton, he's still in the league playing for the Panthers. But the not having a Stanley Cup is going to take away from his legacy. Well, you so, can't take away from Jumbo Joe le- legacy. You can't be doing that. But it's just it just looks better when you have that championship. Oh, yeah. Obviously, it looks better. But Edmonton Oilers, they're in first place in the division right now. Leon Dreisaitl looks like an awesome addition. It's just they're, Connor McDavid and Dreisaitl they're, look so good together. So much off- offensive production out of those two. Hopefully the team depth can step up and they can make a deep playoff run this year and hopefully reach it to a Stanley Cup at some point. It's hard to win in hockey. So very it's difficult. It's very hard to win in hockey. That's, what, that's why Connor McDavid needs a team around him. He can't carry his team there. Does that make him not the best if he can't carry his team there? It's just you want to see the best players compete for the biggest prize in hockey and he can't do it alone right like you saw with Tampa like depth all throughout the lineup 
and they went back to back. I don't know if Connor McDavid can do it with it. Like Mike Smith is forty something years old. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he has it in him to maintain that four series playoff run. Right. And speaking of not having a team, Ottawa Senators, next three games postponed due to a COVID outbreak. Ten players have tested positive. They're not projected to play until November 22nd. Wasn't the wasn't the NHL the one that was like, there's only two players that aren't vaccinated in our entire league? Yeah, they did say that, but not an expert in how vaccines work. I heard, like, somewhere it doesn't help prevent the spread. I think it's just supposed to, like, prevent how severe the symptoms are. Mm. Again, I don't know medical expert. There's, I don't want to be anti-vax talk over here, but it happens. We, we expected to see outbreaks just to the lesser effect, like, severity compared to other instances. That's what the vaccine's for. It's pretty much so to reduce the major side effects. Right. So it, it's not like they're going to come back with, like how what happened to Marco Rossi, the prospect for the Minnesota Wild. He almost died because of COVID. So it's less likely for that to happen. But it's happens. I'm guessing some other teams may face it at some point, but just fight through and hopefully they can continue on. Hopefully. And... For my final segment, I have the Hall of Fame induction ceremony for the 2020 class. Was that this week? I thought that was next week. It's coming up. Okay. They uh, officially announced it today, and there's been a whole bunch of buzz in the media about it. All right. Who was announced? Jerome McGinley. He was captain of the Calgary Flames. Um, One of the best goal scorers of the 20th century. Marion Hossa. He was part of that Chicago Blackhawks dynasty that won three cups this past decade. Right. A little tainted, but still doesn't take away that he had a phenomenal career. He was also one of the few players to go in the Stanley Cup, be in the Stanley Cup final three years in a row on three different teams. How'd that happen? So he was on the, the he was on the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins and they lost to the Detroit Red Wings. And then next year, he left the Pittsburgh Penguins, signed a one-year contract with the Detroit Red Wings. He's like, all right, this team won a cup last year. Let's try to win a cup this year. And Detroit makes it to the Stanley Cup final against the Pittsburgh Penguins. No. (laughs) And Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, Marc-Andre Fleury, that's when Crosby won his first cup. Ugh. And so back to back, this man has lost both times in the Stanley Cup final. And then he signs with the Chicago Blackhawks. And people thought it was an odd choice at first because Chicago at that time was like the young up and coming team, but made the right choice despite now that year's kind of tainted, but still an awesome career, almost a point per game player. They could not one of the cups without him. The other two, the other members, Doug Wilson, prominent NHL defenseman. I know he played for the San Jose Sharks. I'm not too familiar with his career, but he has legendary defensemen in the NHL. Kevin Lowe, another defenseman. He was part of that Oilers dynasty with Gretzky, and they won all those cups. Right. Again, that Oilers team was stacked. Like Almost every person on the team seems like a Hall of Famer. Remarkable career. And then Kim St. Pierre. She is a three times women Olympic gold medalist for Team Canada. All right. And she was the goaltender. Okay. So, always got to shout out to those goaltenders. And then Ken Holland. He was the general manager for the Detroit Red Wings for from like from 1997 until like the mid 2010s. He won four Stanley Cups with the Detroit Red Wings. He drafted guys like Henrik Zetterberg and Pavel Datsuk. Neither of them were first-round picks, and they're borderline to guaranteed Hall of Famers. And they just, he just was really good at drafting, helped build those really good Detroit teams 
that have won multiple Stanley Cups throughout those years. And he's the current general manager of the Edmonton Oilers. All right. And next year, the Hall of Fame spotlight goes to Henrik and Daniel Sedin. So, as both of them at the same year. Yeah, because they, they both retire together. They both, they, they, yeah, they're. It's a remarkable story about brotherhood because they're identical twins. Right. Yeah. And as an identical twin who played hockey, we always got that comparison. Oh, so you're like the Sedin twins and yada yada like that. So. During their draft, they were, like, projected to go back-to-back because -back mm -hmm. they were that good. Yeah. And then Burke, the GM of the Vancouver Canucks, he, draw he had the first overall pick, and, like, he did some, like, trading around because he had, like, a top five pick, and he made a bunch of trades so he could get the second overall pick and the third round third overall pick. And he told Florida, hey, as long as you don't draft one of the Sedins, I will give you the first overall pick. And they were like, sure. So he traded to get the second and third overall pick so he could draft the brothers together because he thought the brothers were better as a value together than separately. Right. That makes sense. So they got drafted together, and then they retired together. It, it was such a cool way. they. I still remember when they retired because um, I was flying into – the Toronto airport because I was visiting family for Christmas and then everywhere just to show how much of a different country Canada is and how much they appreciate hockey. It was just, you could not see, look away without seeing a TV with the Sedin's final game. Like they scored, they sc it, like the game went to overtime. They each had like a few points and they like, they had the game winning overtime goal it was just so cool. That's awesome. No, I, 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 for some reason, I thought um Henrik played longer. Well, um, Henrik played more games because he got injured less. Mm. And I believe Henrik was more of the playmaker, and Daniel was more of the goal scorer. I don't. I, I mean, I don't remember him separately. I just for yeah. some reason Henrik Sedin, I feel like played longer. I don't know. Yeah, why. I think he also has a few more points, but they both have. They were both. Art Ross Trophy winner or MVP at one point. Again, people get confused all the time. And they both have over a thousand career points. They were like the face of the Vancouver Canucks for the longest time. Right. Uh, Roberto Luongo, speaking of Vancouver Canucks, the former goalie. Roberto Luongo is also there. One of the best hockey goalies for a career. He played over 20 years. Like, he, has, he didn't want to kiss Stanley Cup, unfortunately, like the Sedins did. But he played for the Florida Panthers and the Vancouver Canucks. Just a great career, a very long career. He's, like, up there for, like, games played, wins, numbers like that. So, real quick, how does the Hockey Hall of Fame induction work? Is it like a certain amount of people get inducted every year or is it like where you have to get a certain amount of votes? Or A certain amount of people get inducted every year and then they vote on who gets in. What is? What do you mean? So there's like a committee of people who vote. Right, right. But the people that get inducted don't get in all the time? What do you mean by that? Did I say something like that? You said the certain amount of people get inducted and then people vote. Oh, they get um, there's, like, a bunch of people who are nominated, oh. and then they vote on who gets it. All right. And then is there, like, a certain amount of time you have to be retired before you're eligible? Yeah, or? it's, like, five years. All right, so it's how football works. All right. Yeah, it's around that time. All right. Cool. I wasn't sure, because baseball's super weird about that stuff. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. Hayden, Hayden, I've had a few conversations with Hayden about it, and they're also, like, stingy about how... Baseball's so weird about yeah. how they do that. Um, but I mean, they, yeah, that's how, that's how football is. So I wasn't sure what kind of thing it was like. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You're good. And then the final big name player who is eligible is Henrik Zetterberg. He was captain of the Detroit Red Wings for the end of his career. And during the, as the earlier mentioned Stanley Cup run from Detroit, he was teammates with Marion Hossa. Um, he was the Conn Smythe Trophy winner, playoff MVP for that Stanley Cup, just known as a really good defensive forward who's, unfortunately, his career was cut short by injury. But he did win a Olympic gold medal with Sweden in 2006, 
just known as a great two-way center, like the face of the Detroit Red Wings franchise. He was a seventh-round pick, I believe. All right. So just a phenomenal work ethic, good leader, and I would like to see all of these guys get inducted to the Hall of Fame. No, that'd be awesome. He could have had a 1,000 career points if injuries didn't cut it short, which is very unfortunate. But Yeah, no, injuries. We hate injuries. Uh, as, a, guys, hope so. as a show, I think I can make the bold uh, assertion that the Triple Threat Show hates injuries. <laughs> yes, we do. All right, just thought we should get that out there so no one thought we were, like, pro-injuries. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because... We hate all the people who are pro-injury. We do. No one should ever hope people get hurt. All right, that's all I have for hockey. That's what you got for hockey? Yeah. Speaking of, uh, I, m- I mentioned the Baseball Hall of Fame earlier. Um, so I'm going I'm to move right into that, uh, to that baseball, but hold on before I do that. I'd like to remind everyone that you are listening to Triple Threat on WXJM.org and WXJM 88.7 FM Harrisonburg. I am your host, Jeremy, joined by my friend and co-host, Shane. Shane. And without further ado, I would like to uh, hop on in to some of that baseball stuff that happened. So we are on the uh, off-season, you know? Yeah. World Series over, kind of like that dead period before... The inevitable lockout boogeyman that's right, that's lurking right around the corner. Um, but yeah. ignoring that, off season is a pretty fun time too. Pretty fun time. All these people are getting money. All these people are signing new places, change of scenery, kind of get a new scope out of what your life's gonna be for a little bit. You know, get all these options. See who wants you. See who doesn't. You know. You know. I got gotcha. you. Right. Um, and on that vein. We talked about quali- qualifying offers a lot last week. I'm not sure how much you remember about that, Shane. I remember a lot of names. Right. There's a lot of people mentioned. There's like 16 or 14. There's yeah, a lot there of there were There were a lot of qualifying offer- offers. Um, but Wednesday, uh, tomorrow, is uh, the last day to accept those qualifying offers. So, you know, got to... Got to make up your mind quick, all those people that have been offered qualifying offers. <laughs> Anybody been signed yet? or? Yeah, there's been, there's been, a, there's, there was actually one, there's one big signing. Uh, Erod, uh, Eduardo Rodriguez. I hope I got that name right, because I'm just trying to remember that off the top of my head. Because <laughs> I just wrote down Erod. Um, uh, he was a Boston, Boston pitcher. Uh... He signed a five-year, seventy-seven million dollar contract with the uh, with the Tigers. Sorry, Hayden typed with with escalators. <laughs> 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 uh, and he has an opt-out after two years, so he signed out with the Tigers, Detroit Tigers. They're also rumored to sign uh, Carlos Correa, even though apparently the Astros offered him like a three hundred million dollar contract. Which, insane amount of money. Can't even fathom that. Um, Is he worth $300 million? You know, maybe. 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 Probably. In your personal opinion, would you pay him $300 million? Uh, Hayden is messaging me right now. He says, Eduardo, I got the name right. Let's go. (laughs) Um, He did have a qualifying offer. Uh, and he says Correa is worth all of that, okay. to answer your question. All right, I trust Aiden. Right. Um, I would say probably, but also, like, the Astros are so stacked, you know, that uh, maybe it's just the people around him. It probably isn't. He's probably worth it. But, like, $300 million is a lot of money. It's, like, so much money. I trust Hayden's opinion, though. I also he's, trust Hayden's opinion. He's better yelling at me right now. If he's now. high on a player, I've, I've got, I've got the, I I've trust got the, him. I've got the three dots of death, and they're coming <laughs> at me. <laughs> uh, he said Detroit lost a second or a third because they signed Erod. So I guess because he Erod had a uh, qualifying offer from the Red Sox, right? Yeah. And Detroit was like, actually, I'm going to steal him. They now have to give the Red Sox some picks. Yeah. Compensation, you know. 
because they were like, I claim you. Yeah, the NHL has something similar to that, but I know the pick requirements are a lot higher for players. Right, yeah. And the general managers don't like to do it because they're a bunch of, it's a boys club and it's kind of like a respect thing. It's like, hey, I won't do this to you if you don't do this to me. Right. You know, uh, same kind of vein as qualifying offers. The Giants, uh, they extended their manager, uh, Gabe Kapler, after a 100-plus win season, turned that entire franchise around. People were thinking, oh, these guys are just going to be bad or average at best. And you know what they did? Not much. They just had the best record in the entire league. Not a big deal. Yeah, not a big deal. It didn't matter in the end because they couldn't get past the Dodgers. But, yeah. you know, it's still... They're still contenders. It's still a pretty good season. I actually don't think they're contenders anymore. Really? Yeah. They lost Buster Posey, and they're old, and they're inconsistent, and I don't trust them. Even with the pitchers, I do not... I do not trust them. I don't think... I really don't think they'll be able to do it again next year. Um... Especially, I, I think the main reason is because they lost Buster Posey. He was such a huge, vital part of them, their their team, in spirit and in playing ability. You know, he was like the clubhouse leader kind of guy. Yeah. But. That really sucks when you see, like, a championship team and then. Well, they won three. They won three championships, so. I mean, you know, a championship caliber team, they fall short in the playoffs and then everyone jumps ship. Right. It just I, sucks. Like, if you stay together, you probably could get there, if not... Well, they already did it, you know. They had their window. This was just, like, a last grasp as the window was shutting on their fingers kind of thing. They were like, wait, I wanted to keep it open! <laughs> and then they got their fingers squashed in the playoffs kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, which is going to happen. It's an impressive last grasp. They had, they had yeah. some really strong fingers. <laughs> <laughs> What a beautiful metaphor. Um, uh, GM news. Former Angels GM, uh, Billy Epler, is now the new Mets GM. If you uh, remember, the Mets GM got fired after a uh, drinking and driving situation. Not cool. Don't do that. Not fun. We saw, very, we saw another incident recently about similar stuff. Rugs. Yeah. It's not fun. Don't do it. It's kind of stupid. Get a cab or something. There's Ubers and Lyfts. It, there's no excuse for you to uh, drive and drink. You know? No excuse at all. And if, especially if you're in professional sports, you definitely can afford it. Right. Um, now, I don't understand why they hired this dude. Uh, he... I don't know how much he... Uh, the Mets gonna met. I don't know. Yeah, the Mets gonna met. Yeah, but... Also, the Angels gonna angel, <laughs> right? What? Oh, I'm not familiar with the Angel gonna angel. Uh, all right, it's not a thing. But like the Angels, kind of, kind of bad. They kind of suck, <laughs> and um, it's not their players' fault because they have the arguably the best player of all time for his entire career, Mike Trout, drafted him, and they've had him since 2010. If I had to, if I'm trying to remember, 2010-ish, around that time. They've had him since 2010. I want you to guess how many playoff games they've won since he's been there. Five. Zero. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, that's frustrating. Yeah. So they got him. More recently. Uh, I'm surprised Mike Trout hasn't wanted to leave. I don't know, man. He's like a team player, I guess. He's got a nice home and a family down in L.A. Why would you want to leave L.A.? <laughs> the fault line. Why would you want to leave L.A.? Uh, I just the I just have a feeling the place is going to be set on fire, and then there's going to be a giant earthquake that's going to separate it from the rest of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you getting this feeling? Is this like a movie you've seen? What is this? Yeah, I have saw a movie, and I'm like, oh, that could happen. I mean, The Rock was in it, so it's got to be true. <laughs> <laughs> Something about San Andreas. <laughs> you know, the Rock. The Rock's movies are documentaries. Yeah, we all know this. Um, but more recently, they have a uh, Shohei Otani. You heard about him, right? He's going to win the MVP this year. He's super good at baseball. Um, you know what they did? 
absolutely right. nothing. They won about half their games this year. Angels suck. And the they're Mets, wasting talent. The Mets were like, ooh, I want some of what they're having. <laughs> and they went and got that GM and put him in the Mets. Now, a little bit of a combination of a supreme disappointment and metting. <laughs> I'm very curious about how this is turn out. You're going to turn out. And you know what? I'm a caller right now. I'm feeling an 0 in 162 <laughs> season. <laughs> um, and then there were more. Uh, there were more uh, more awards given out this season. Uh, you know, the some of the big awards are coming out. We talked about the Gold Glove last year or uh, last week. Uh, there were platinum gloves given out, given for just the best defender. Gold Glove is best defender at the position. Platinum Glove given to the best defender overall. Nolan Arenado won the Platinum Glove for the fifth year in a row. Jeez. Yeah. What team does he play for? He plays for the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, he was on the Colorado Rockies beforehand. He got traded this season. Um, and I forget who it was in the AL because they didn't win it five times what in a row. What position does he play? Third base. Hot corner. Um, yeah. You know, fun stuff. Uh, and then Rookie of the Year came out. Uh, in the AL, Randy Arozarena. Uh, which Hayden's explained this to me, but I he's not here, so he can't yell at me right now about it. I don't like that he is considered a rookie. I don't like it at all. Oh, what's what he, did he played? Do? Oh, here we go. Uh, oh, he says uh, Correa won the platinum glove in the AL. The guy we were talking about, uh, three hundred million dollars guy. Yeah. yeah, he won the platinum glove. Um, good pretty good. Pretty good. No wonder he's getting paid, or may get paid $300 million. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so what's the, with the whole rookie so situation? He played in last year's playoffs, right? Yeah. Not this year's playoffs, last year's playoffs. And also before. But the way rookies work in the MLB, it's like something to do with uh, service time. You have to play for a certain amount of time to can be considered playing for the year or something like that. Yeah. And they manipulated his service time in such a way that... He's about to yell at me. I got the three dots coming yeah. at me. Uh, but I'm going to try and get through this before he can get to me. Um, Just flip the phone over. No, no, no. I, he's, he's got the right information, so it's good to come through. Um, so, like, this is... Uh, it, it's weird. They manipulated the service time so that he could... He could... I don't know why... So they could use... They could have him for longer or something under a rookie contract or under a contract. Um, but he's not a rookie, is my point. Yeah. And like he, he won Rookie of the Year, but but he's not... He's played a few... He's not a rookie. Yeah. Uh, he said they need 30 days of service time to lose rookie status. So they had him probably play for like 29 days or some stupid thing like that. Yeah. Um, and they were like, oh, he's still a rookie. <laughs> um, so it's it's just frustrating, you know? And it's not like he's not good. He's obviously he's a great player. Yeah. And he deserves recognition. But he's also not a rookie. Gotcha. Um, the Rays, he plays for the Rays. And they had another guy. They had Wander Franco, who I think deserves to win Rookie of the Year solely based on the fact that he's actually a rookie. He's actually a rookie. <laughs> <laughs> so the NHL has something similar to that. So if you have somebody who is drafted into an organization, but they play in the second best league in the world until he's 26, and then he comes to play in the NHL, and he's competing against a 23 year old for rookie of the year. Would you do you still consider him a rookie? Right. See, that's the thing, right? Yeah. I understand that he's technically not a rookie, but he's also a rookie in the league. Yeah. You know, it's his first year in the actual NHL. Yeah. Which I mean, he shouldn't be considered a rookie, but it's also like this man played in the MLB. He played yeah. in the World Series, and he's still considered a rookie the next season. Yeah. It's just frustrating. Um, no, but I agree that that's kind of it's kind of similar. Yeah. But it's also just a little bit different because it is a different league. And I yeah. get what you're saying—a 33-year-old rookie <laughs> competing against <laughs> that, like a 21-year-old guy. That actually happened guy. though. Yeah. Because um, Hall of Famer Mike Madonna, who's drafted first overall, has a great season. 
doesn't win Rookie of the Year because a 30-something-year-old KHL guy comes over and puts up a ridiculous <laughs> season. <laughs> and they're like, why is this 30-year-old considered a rookie? So they like capped it at like 27. Uh, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. That's yeah. a good rule to put And in. I'm also the same guy because Artemi Panarin did the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I was just, this guy's not a rookie. It should have gone to Connor McDavid, but Connor McDavid got injured and Panarin had a good year. And I'm like, he should not win Rookie of the Year. And then Kaprizov the rival of the Blackhawks and my favorite team does the same thing and I'm like he's definitely rookie of the year is he 30? huh? is Kaprizov 30? no he's 26 really? yeah I thought he was like 22 no Kaprizov he was he came into the league at 26 so people are like oh he's not actually a rookie I think he's 27 now ah like right right before the cutoff I see they the hey get him the hardware you know yeah get it to him Uh, Hayden says that he uh, Rosarena had 99 plate appearances before the year that's a big enough sample yeah. size, you know. I know for the NHL, it's like nine games played in a season. Right. So I guess it's I guess it's thirty games in the in the MLB because they play like double the amount of games and yeah. stuff. So I don't know. Just grind like gears a little bit. Yeah. And I, it's fine. He's young. He played like no time, but still. Uh, and then in the NL, a true rookie one, <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan India, red second baseman. He put up excellent numbers this season. I did not write down the numbers because I uh, I forgot to do that in preparation for the show. But he uh, he put up really good numbers this season. What he position is he? Second baseman. All right. Cincinnati Reds. So it's fun. Congrats to him. Yeah, no, it's it's great. Uh, he he was he was clearing away the best rookie in the NL this year. Um, I mean, he was just hitting home runs left and right. Every other day, you'd look up, oh, gone, you know? Yeah. Um, and we talked about the Reds last show. If you, I don't know if you were, have good a memory or not. Um, With baseball, I'm just slowly picking up bits and pieces here and there. <laughs> I don't know where half these teams are. Right. We I were, don't know we a few were, names. We were talking about how they should have made the playoffs last year. Kind yeah. Of um, and he was a big part of that. He was he was a major part of their team through, throughout the year. And it's great to see him recognized. Um, and then finally, last thing I got for baseball, uh, we talked about, I mean, obviously we talked about the World Series, right? Uh, big agent for baseball players, uh, Scott Boris. He represents a lot of Washington Nationals. He represents people like Soto, Strasburg, and he also represents Bryce Harper, people like that. Uh, many other people around the league, but he said that the Braves winning the World Series was a direct result of other teams tanking. Yeah. So, story about the Braves. They lost their best player to a torn ACL right around halfway through the season. Um, and instead of saying, ugh, all right, I guess we're done for the season, they went out and they got four outfielders. Yeah. They got future World Series MVP Jorge Soler. They got future uh, uh, NL... CS MVP Eddie Rosario and they went out and got Jock Peterson who was a major part of them beating the Dodgers um, and they got one other guy uh, Adam Duvall from the Marlins um, but they went out and got all these guys and they gave up next to nothing you know all yeah. because they traded to they traded from they got traded from bad teams um, and these teams are like eh, I'm trying to lose get out of here you can have him for uh that pocket link you got. I don't understand why the MLB doesn't trade draft picks. I don't like it. I think yeah. it's super cool. Because draft picks make trade trees so cool. Absolutely. Because you can be like, oh, we trade away this superstar, but that first round pick gave us this guy. Right. Um, and, you know, that's something for the lockout in less than a month to decide on. Yeah. That's not going to change, I don't think, because that's not high in their list. But I think that'd be cool. I think that'd be a cool thing to see. Uh, trades being able to happen because like at least because you wouldn't have this issue where it's like they could actually get something out of the player right I mean they got something because it helps a rebuilding team because not only do you suck you also get other assets to help with the rebuild so here's the thing about baseball right it's not like it's not like football where draft picks go and play right away right they go into the farm system right yeah they go in. They go into the low. They go into the minor leagues, right? Yeah. So, when you're trading, so what they do is they trade for prospects, which in a way is kind of trading for picks. 
because these guys haven't played in the big leagues yet. Yeah. They're basically basically play, p- trading for picks that have already happened. You know? You're saying, hey, I want this prospect. It's the equivalent of saying, hey, I want this pick yeah. that I'd use to p- take this guy, you know, kind of thing. So it's they kind of already have it, but it's not quite the same. But also, like, you know, these guys spend years in the minor leagues. So it's not like getting a draft pick. I mean, pick. the NHL is the same way because some players spend up spend up to like five years in the minor league but every like most first round picks if you're not in the top five top ten you're probably sitting in the minor league for like two or three seasons at least right but there's also like 40 rounds in the in the in the, in the mlb draft so you know it's a it's a huge yeah. farm system so i and i guess in a way that's kind of trading picks well, like with draft picks you don't have to be stuck with this certain player like if this team doesn't necessarily have prospects you want. You can just say, oh, give us this pick, and we can just pick the prospect we want at that time in the draft. Right, yeah, that's kind of what they're doing. Yeah. You know, it's that, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. You know? Uh, it's more certain. You're like, I, have, I think if I get this pick, I can get this guy. Yeah. It's like a more certain draft pick kind of thing. And the MLB draft is not really that fun to watch. I disagree. All right. Actually, is it? I don't know. Me, me, Hayden, and one of Hayden's friends, Jack, did a little uh, live Twitch stream during the last uh, MLB draft. And that was a lot of fun. All right. We were just chilling there for like seven hours. <laughs> 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 but wouldn't it be cool if, no, like, just going into next year's draft knowing your team has three first round picks? No, it would be awesome. Yeah. No doubt. It would be super cool. But, like, that's not going to happen. It's just not. Uh, we blew right past the top of the hour. My bad. Um,. I'd like to remind everyone, uh, six minutes late, <laughs> that you are listening to Triple Threat on WXJM.org and WXJM 88.7 FM Harrisonburg. I am your host, Jeremy, joined by my friend and co-host, Shane, and usually Hayden, but he's not here right now. Um, uh, let's see. Let's do some NBA. Ro- what you got? Oh, is that it for MLB news? Um, yeah, I, I don't got much more for MLB. All right. We um, should probably move on so we can cover the other two sports. I don't have much for basketball right. either. Um, the NBA today came out that they fined the Timberwolves $250,000 for uh, some stuff they did. The players did some uh, against league rules play, player activity down in Miami in the offseason. Very vague. Yeah. I didn't read into it because it was like an hour before the show that this came out and I was kind of pooped, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is pretty late. God, my arguably favorite team. I, 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 I don't know. I, I hate to call myself a basketball fan because I really don't look into it. I just adopt the Minnesota teams. Right. No, that's fine. So it's just like, I don't know, Minnesota, get your Minnesota just hasn't been run very well uh, for a while. They they kind of just ran their organization into the ground. They had a good team for like a few years with Kevin Garnett. Yeah. And then. Do you want to hear how I remember him? Go for it. Was that the guy in the Taco Bell commercial? Probably. <laughs> I just saw a Timberwolf he, on. He, the... he was the guy from. Uh, he was the guy from Uncut Gems. The tall guy. I have no idea. What you that haven't is. seen Un- no. Uncut Gems, the Adam Sandler movie. I've heard of it. <laughs> But that's how I remember the Timberwolves. I'm like, oh, they had that one guy in a Taco Bell commercial. He's, he's like seven feet tall, oh, yeah. bald black guy. And I heard he was like the only good guy on the Timberwolves. He wasn't the only one, but like yeah. he was the main one. He was the big star. Um, surprising news. Wizards, they're pretty good. The Wizards are pretty good. They got this guy. I don't know if you heard of him. Kuz. Kyle Kuzma. He, uh, he was like uh, being a... Uh, Tossed out of the city of L.A. because of uh, his alleged uh, house building problem. <laughs> um, what? Bricks, you know, kept shooting bricks. Enough <laughs> bricks to build a whole house. You never heard that before? Yeah, he kept building houses for everyone in the playoffs. And they were like, ah, got to get him out of here. And the Wizards were like, hey, you give us him and some other people and we'll give you a uh, Russell Westbrook. And as of right now, if the season ended today, I think the Wizards won that trade. Wizards are currently first place in the Eastern Conference, which is not wow. a thing I thought I'd say all season or ever, probably. Except when they won their first game of the season. I was like, season could end now, you know, we're 1-0, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. 
Um, but you know, this is a pleasant surprise. Everyone's playing great. Uh, Brad Beal, Bradley Beal took a little bit of a step back, but like they're playing great for now. For now. Yeah. Like it's like my optimism about the Washington like, Capitals. Hey, they're like they're like almost fifteen games in. Yeah. You know that's pretty good. I mean, if they keep this pace up, yeah, they'll be the best team in the East still. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, you're, it seems like you're not really high on a lot of the Washington teams. No, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, they're all, they're all, sorry. The Wizards are in the middle of a rebuild. Yeah. Or they were until this season. I still think they're in a rebuild. The Capitals, I believe, should blow it up. Still. But they're not going to. They're not going to. Because but o- o- OV score break record. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, we forgot to say that. He did move into fourth time. in all Oh, time yeah, Brad Hall, yeah. Uh, so, thank you. Um, yeah, I think they should blow it up. They're not going to because, as you so eloquently put it, OV goal score now. <laughs> Break record, <laughs> then retire. Gretzky Then who? blow up. No. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Um, and then the Nationals, they just blew it up, which much better to blow it up than have to deal with mediocrity for five years before you finally decide, eh. But they don't have enough edge again. They do. His name is Juan Soto. Is he on the verge of breaking one of the longest held, notorious records in NHL history? He's good. History? If he continues at the pace he's at, he's going. He's also to a lot younger too, isn't he? He's so young. Yeah. He's so good. Oh, he's one of the best players in the league. Hayden oh, loves oh. him because he gets on base like. Yeah. Almost every other at bat, which insane. He's got like the third highest on base percentage of all time. Yeah. Already, and he's only played. He's only like twenty two, so. Ovechkin's like older, so they're like, "Yeah, we can put off the rebuild until he decides to." Like, it's pretty much whatever he says goes right. at this point. Um, but I think they should blow it up. They're not going to. Yeah. We just, this. I mean, for a contention standpoint, yeah. yes, but I ha- very much happy to keep Ovechkin yeah. as a Washington Capital. The Nats just blew it up, you know. Yeah. And right. then the Reds get they're, they're going to be rebuilding for a while. And then the football team's the football team. Yeah, I don't care about them. Yeah. So, uh, so, so they so they don't they don't matter to me. Yeah. Uh, I'm 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 one more here on the Giants, you know. <laughs> so they they also they also are in the middle of a deep rebuild. So uh, they've been in a deep rebuild for like almost ten years yeah. now. Yeah, and bad ownership. No one wants them. Yeah, um, that kind of thing. So no, I'm not very o- optimistic about any team right now. But I mean, if people are starting to get out of the rebuild, you yeah. know, we had that brief period from like 2012 to 20. 19, where all the teams were good. the All the Washington teams that aren't the, the football, football team. team. All the Washington teams that I care about were yeah. good. You know? The Wizards were really good in, like, 2012 to 2015. Ah, oh, that was nice. And then they kind of went right back down. Yeah. Um, the Caps, you know, they've been good forever. Um, and they were kind of... They peaked, and then they're like, they're, like, here right now on their way down. Yeah. Uh, they're still having a good start, even though they don't have their entire second line. They're still they're still a playoff team. Yeah, they're still a playoff, but they're not gonna, they're not going to be they're not a contender. They it, it's hard for me to see them beat Tampa Bay. Right, that's what I mean. If you're not a contender, yeah, a playoff team in the NHL is basically middling. You know, because could half you the teams imagine if Henrik Lundqvist actually played for the Capitals? I actually don't think I could. I could not imagine him outside of a Rangers uniform. Yeah. But it was so cool that we signed him, and unfortunately he had yeah. to retire with that heart issue, but yeah. that would have been so cool. No, it would it would have been nice yeah. because, you know, King Henry, you know, Henrik. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not super optimistic about it, but it's cool that the Wizards are doing great. It's, yeah. it's awesome. <sighs> Any other basketball news? Um, not really. Not really. No. Um, I heard... I saw something about Steph Curry breaking the all times three point shots made record uh, or something. Of course like that. he did. This is like the best shooter of all time. Yeah. You know, he 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 don't miss. He actually don't miss. Yeah. You know, like I don't miss, but he actually don't miss. <laughs> yeah, instead of saying like Kobe when you go make a basketball shot, I people now say Curry sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um yeah, so that's what I got for basketball. I'm gonna close out the show with some football stuff. Uh, real quick, we'll run through the stuff that's important. Uh, Cam Newton signed with the Panthers. All he did casually was uh, casually. throw was score two touchdowns in on route to beat the uh, Cardinals. 
I'm he, back, baby. He, the first two times he touched the ball, uh, there were points scored, points being touchdowns, which was awesome to see. I love, I love me some Cam Newton back in Carolina. There's it, never a dull moment with him. No, it's super fun to see. Um, Odell Beckham, he signed with the Rams. We saw him play a little bit tonight. Didn't matter because the Rams are kind of... Uh, they don't look too good. You know, I I love the Rams. I love I, they look so good at the beginning of the season. I thought they were they couldn't get worse after they got uh, Von Miller and Odell. Um, but I mean, somehow they did. They did lose Robert Woods. He tore his ACL, which is a huge loss for them. He's no superstar like Odell or Von Miller or guys like that. You know, they're but, still getting used to the team. It's probably just a rough patch in the season. I wouldn't be too worried yet. Right, but losing a guy like Robert Woods, who's like big in the locker room, he's yeah. he's you don't he's a wide receiver that can block, and that's super rare right now. I don't know how much football you see and how much you know about. I that. didn't know wide receivers. That's like a rare talent for them. It's so rare, dude. I wouldn't expect a wide receiver to have to block. Right, exactly. But this guy will go in there and like be the lead blocker on a run play. He'll yeah. go and take that safety or linebacker or defensive end running right at him and push him out of the way, you know? And that's that's hard. That's something that you want to see. You know, that's something you want to see. That's one of those things that when a wide receiver makes a big... If a wide receiver can, like, pancake you, yeah, that's going to get a huge pop at everyone on the team. That's going to get everyone going. And Robert Woods was that kind of guy. Um, and it's a big loss for them, unfortunately. Um, hope, he gets, hope he gets better and is ready for next season. That kind of thing. Um, there were also some lawsuits... Uh, the Aaron Rodgers fallout, him and Alan Lazard were fined $1,400 for COVID protocol breaking, yeah. uh, lawsuits. John Gruden suing the NFL because... Oh, no. Um, and I, I hate agreeing with this man, but I kind of see his point. There were 65,000 emails. I thought it was 650,000 emails. So, yeah, 600... There's a lot of emails. There were, there were, there were too many emails. Um, and... The NFL claims there were no leaks, right? They, 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 there were no hacker. They just leaked. There was no hacker. Someone in the NFL, out of 650,000 emails, the only emails that have come out, John Gruden's emails. The NFL... It's a valid... From, from what I can tell, the NFL did this on purpose. They were like, hmm, how do we get this guy out of here? That's actually a good point. Right. If they have 650,000, you don't think... Anybody there's gotta else be other. There's, there's gotta, gotta be, be other, other stuff in there. There's gotta know? be other dirt. There's no way there isn't, especially with this investigation on the Washington football team that is so corrupt, so rotten. Yeah. It's just there's no way that was the only thing. If he felt, I've heard this comparison from people from other from other places online and other talk shows. If he felt comfortable talking to Bruce Allen like that, there's no reason other people didn't. Yeah. He's, I, I'm a hundred percent sure. There's, there's. I'm, I'm like 99% sure that there's at least there's some other emails that have damning evidence like that. But like, he, he's suing them for that kind of thing. Which... He did say some awful things. He's an, awful, he, he's an awful person, but he has a point. He has a point. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to side with him. I'm not going to side with the NFL. I'm just going to report that it's happening. Yeah. Uh, less fun, Dalvin Cook was named in a lawsuit. Oh, I've heard uh, about this one. So this one, I heard more about it. I think he'll be fine. Yeah, it's... it's the lawsuit... Sorry. Uh, the lawsuit alleges that he assaulted a woman. Um, it was like his fiance or something like that. It was like his ex or something. Yeah. Um, his attorney claims Cook was assaulted and extorted. So what I heard from digging into this and seeing other people talking about this, um, Dalvin Cook, this girl broke into his house. He was like, excuse me, what are you doing? And defended himself, right? Yeah. She then sues him because she, he hit her. You know? Because trespassing. Yeah. Um, that's the very basic rundown. I read about this on Tuesday, like last week. So I don't have the, I don't have the greatest memory of it. Um, but very basically, I believe that is what the situation is. Yeah. Um, it seems like he'll be fine if that is what it is because... You know, you can't break into someone's house and I, then I say they abused you. I briefly looked at this, and I was like, oh, God, not just 
things couldn't get worse. And it just seems like a bunch of he said, she said. It seems like he... It just... It would just be hard for me to believe that he would do something like this. See, the thing is... But the thing is, there's probably several other NFL players we've said the same thing about. The thing about Dalvin Cook is this isn't the first time. Oh, did he have issues in college or something? In college, down at Florida State, he allegedly punched a woman at a bar, and that's why he dropped so low in the draft. Oh. (coughs) Yeah. So it's not like this is the first time that uh, allegations have come out, but this one seems more like... The other one, I'm pretty sure, happened. Yeah. Going to say that? Yeah. This one, I think he's in the clear. Yeah. This one he's currently being sued for, I think he's in the clear. He dealt with whatever happened at Florida State. That's in the past. That's like a few years ago now. Um, obviously, it's not okay to do that, but he, he's dealt with that. That's that's in the rearview mirror. Um, this, I think he's fine. Yeah, especially from what I read. I think, I if think she it's broke fine. into his house, then. Yeah. Hopefully. Or, yeah, let's just move on. Yeah. Um, moving on into the recap of the week Thursday Night Football. Had maybe the greatest play I've ever seen. <laughs> All right, let me let me let me do this for you. All Paint right, the picture. I'm I'm, I'm gonna do this because this was super fun. Dolphins playing the Ravens. Dolphins down at like ten or fifteen yard line. Uh, Tua drops back. They run an or they run a running back screen. You know what that is? No. Little little uh, screen pass to the running back. Pass behind the line of the scrimmage. Yeah. Get all your blockers ahead. Block for the running back. Hopefully you get into the end zone. Pass is just... Uh, the running back runs into... Pressure comes, because the offensive line has to come out and block. So pressure's going to come quick. you got to yeah. dump it off. Uh, pressure comes, he gets rid of it. Running back's not ready for it. Offensive lineman number 68. Beautiful man. Snags the ball with one hand. Brings it in. Says, this is my moment. <laughs> this is my time to prove to everyone... I am an athlete. <laughs> I am a football player. Look at me go. Rumbles. This man goes. This man makes it to the two-yard line where he is met by three, two Ravens defenders. He dives, gets hit, does a flip. Holds ball out, holds ball out, crosses goal line, touchdown. <laughs> One problem. Penalty. He is an offensive lineman and is therefore not allowed to touch the ball. No. So, laundry on the field. Illegal touching, offense number 68. No touchdown. Lose 10 yards. This is, without a doubt, the single greatest thing I've ever seen on a football field. All right? It didn't count. By far the greatest thing I've ever seen on a football field, all right? I love it so much. I love him so much. <laughs> he, uh, the Dolphins actually put a picture of that, of him doing the flip into the end zone um, on, on an elevator door. It's awesome. I love it so much. It's so much fun. Um, I gotta pull up the video. Yeah, now. please do. But, um, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna move on because... Um, we got some other stuff to cover. Right. Um, another awesome thing I saw that didn't count this week, um, uh, in the Sunday, in the Monday night game, there was a really cool interception. (laughs) Matthew Stafford threw an interception, right? I mean, yeah, Shane, watch this. Just go ahead. Look at this man go. Athlete! (laughs) Athlete! (laughs) What an athlete! Look at him, look at him tumble. Look at him go. Hey, ball crossed the line. That is a touchdown is all I'm saying. Beautiful. He barely got there. Yeah, but he, he got there is <laughs> my point. Look at that guy. Look at this. Run. Look, at, it's, it's going to cross the line. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Boom. Bang. Oh, touchdown <laughs> right there. Over the line. That's a touchdown. Oh, incredible. Oh. I love it so much. Guy was so determined. Hey, I love it. I'm not kidding when I say that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. All right? He is upside down. Yes. The ball is over the plane. The touchdown is awesome. <laughs> they... I, this, Screw the rules. That they should have just allowed That's that. That's what I'm saying. That is what I am saying. It's like there is a penalty, but since this happened, we have to allow it. Right. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> um, there was also a butt interception. 
Yeah. Uh, tonight, uh, pass interference on the guy that intercepted it didn't count, but still it was an awesome catch. Yeah. He like blocked it and then kind of reached through his legs and trapped it against his butt. Super cool. Didn't count. Lots of fun. So the two greatest things I saw this week didn't count. Um, but do you know what was great and did count? What's that? The Vikings won a game. Vikings did win <laughs> a game. They actually won a game. They beat the the charges. I have the charges. some hope, some yeah, very little optimism. But I don't know. It's just kind of like I, the Vikings are gonna Vikings some find some way to. Yeah, me, me and Hayden were watching this game, and we were like. So, uh, how are the Vikings going to lose this game? They were up 10. Chargers were driving. And we were like, how are they going to lose this game? They didn't, somehow. Which is surprising. Magic, you know? It's like the offense actually put up points and the defense... Did it enough. Did enough. It's just like, why, where, where was this whole season? <laughs> <laughs> um, in other news, another big upset. The Buccaneers, they lost to the Washington football team. Taylor Heineke is their kryptonite. He's out there... <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. This this man this man plays his best football against the uh against the Buccaneers. I think they engineered the greatest drive in the entire season. They had a ten minute drive, nineteen plays. Uh they got the ball with ten minutes and fifty five seconds. They did not give the ball back to the Buccaneers until there were twenty nine seconds left on the play clock. That is insane. They scored a touchdown. They marched down that field in 10 minutes. That is the most perfect drive of all time. They iced the game. They scored a game-winning touchdown. They were up like four or something. And they scored a touchdown on fourth and goal to end the game. But they held that ball for 10 whole minutes. You don't see that nowadays. Like, I don't know. It's it's crazy that they Some were Some people just have their team. Yeah. Like Tom Brady against the like the Saints just do really well against Tom Brady for whatever reason, yeah. and then I guess Heineke just does well against the Bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a uh, Boston Scott. We don't talk about Boston Scott on this show. His name does not exist. Okay, it, he does not exist. He is not a person. <laughs> um, the Giants didn't lose. They didn't lose. You know who else didn't lose? The, the Lions. Lions. <laughs> the Lions also did not lose a game. Um, not to say that they won, but they didn't lose. You know, they uh, they had a little bit of what we call a tie with the uh, Ben Roethlisberger-less uh, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. Final score: sixteen to sixteen, or nineteen to nineteen. Nope, sixteen to doesn't I matter. It was sixteen sixteen. I think it was sixteen sixteen. What Whatever. an odd score. Yeah. Um, Jared Goff wanted to lose the game. Uh, the Steelers cat, uh, the C- Steelers receiving and t- receivers and tight ends wanted to lose the game. And when you have both teams wanting to lose the game, um, no one tends to win the game, which is what <laughs> happened. Um, and you know what's super funny? Um, rookie running backs on both sides, uh, Najee Harris and some dude on the Lions, he's like a <laughs> third string running back on the Lions or whatever, they both were like, hey, did you know that NFL games could end in ties? Because I didn't. Because college, you can't end in ties. You keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they didn't know the game could end in ties. So they were just like, wait, what? The game's over? Hold on. Wait, oh, hold... <laughs> What? <laughs> I thought we were going to keep going. <laughs> what is this? Nah... Um, super fun, you know? They were just, they were just a little confused. You know, look, rookie hazing, right? Yeah. Surprise, tie game. <laughs> and, uh, ugh, you know. That was, uh, that was, that was most of the stuff that, ha- what, what else did I miss in uh, NFL this week? All I remember was, I think the Lions had the lead when I was driving back to the apartment. And then when I finally got back, I saw it was a tie. And I'm like, no! <laughs> I wanted the Steelers to lose so badly. <laughs> I wanted something good to happen to Detroit. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's just... I feel like... I don't know if a tie is worse than a lot. It's just... I think it's better it's than so a It's so unsatisfying. It's, it's much better than a I mean, if you're a Lions fan, you'd probably take it. But that's just... 
so frustrating. Yeah. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to say thank you for listening to Triple Threat on WXJM 88.7 FM Harrisonburg and WXJM.org. I have been Jeremy, joined by Shane and usually Hayden from Triple Threat. We would like to say have a good night. Good night. Thank you for listening. Please check out the YouTube channel. Good night.